all agree that that is what we all want. Amen? Yes, sir. <laughs> so we can say amen to that song. Amen. Because I believe and I agree that we all agree, are in agreement on that we have one goal, and that is receiving one day that mansion robe and that crown. That's right. And, uh, that is a great hope. If you have no other hope in life, mm -hmm. to have that hope is the uh, hope of all hopes. Right? right. And uh, have that hope will take you through whatever it is you might go through, um, that hope of knowing that one day, one day, we can make heaven our home Amen. and that uh, all this will be over. Yes. And uh, thankful to God for allowing us to come back together again. Uh, I don't have a marker, so I'm not able to write my lesson text, but that's all right. Uh, the title of the lesson is, Who is It? Uh, all of us know that knock knock, right? Yes. Say knock knock. Who's there? Who is it, right? In Revelation, Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. Amen. Amen. And he says that whosoever hears my voice mm -hmm. and opens the door, well. I will come to him or into him All right. and we will sup with and will sup with him and he with me. Amen. Right. Uh, Jesus uh, used this and said that he stands at the door. And when I think of a door, uh, in Spanish, Damascus, what is the word for door? Porta. All right, porta. And we get the word portal also from that word, right? Yes. You know the word portal. And when you think about a portal, it's something that you go through to take you from one place to another. Okay. And we must realize that Jesus is the way. He says, I am the way, yeah. mm -hmm. the truth and the light. No man comes to the Father but by me. And he also says to enter ye in at the straight gate. So when you think about the door, a gate, a way, that Jesus is the portal. And what is what is that portal take you from one instance? When you go through a door, you go from inside of a house to outside a house, or vice versa, from outside into the house, right? And so Jesus takes us from outside of the family of God, and through Jesus Christ we come into the family of God, right? right. He takes us out of a world of sin and death into a world of life and righteousness. You see what I'm saying? That Amen. Jesus is the portal, the way in which we uh, enter into righteousness, which leads ultimately to salvation. Amen. Amen. And uh, if we understand that, I always think about, you know, when, when back in the days, people used to joke about when uh, Saturday morning, you get that knock on the door, right? All knocks are not the same, right? Yeah. Right? And sometimes on those Saturday mornings, you get that knock on the door and you was like, who is it, right? And then you look through the people and you see that it's a Jehovah's Witness or something like that, right? <laughs> right? And what do people usually do when that happens? They go hide behind the furniture. They get quiet, almost hold their breath so that they don't allow that person who is at the door to come in, right? Amen. Because that person is not a welcome guest, right? right? Or you can have somebody come over and be like, who is this at my door at this time of night, right? But the door, uh, a knock on the door represents certain thing. It represents a certain thing. When somebody knocks on your door, that is a beckoning. Okay. Right? They are calling you. So Jesus is saying, I am standing at the door and I am beckoning you. Amen. I am calling you. He's not coming to your door and kicking down the door, right? right? He's not coming in and raiding you and pulling you and making you serve him, right? Like some religious groups are trying to force people into serving him, but that's not how Jesus is, right? Amen. He is beckoning you with a knock on the door. Amen. And like I said, there are different knocks when, when you hear that knock and sometimes, you know, somebody comes to your door and it's that hard knock. Yeah. You go to, you sound like you're knocking like the police or something, right? You don't want to hear that knock, right? That's not the knock you want to hear, but if you hear a knock where somebody's rapping on the door, it, you know, that is a more calming call, right? And then like, oh, I wonder who that is. And you go with the uh, 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 intriguing and you want to know who that is because of the type of knock. And then you know, when you look at that people on the day, you see that it's Jesus. And the problem is a lot of times 
people don't want to open the door and let him in, right? Because they want everything that he has for you on the out, you know, everything that he promises, but they don't want to let him in to their house, right? And so they'll say, who is it? And hey, Jesus is Jesus, but you a lot of people are not ready for him to come in to their homes, right? And uh, and that's why the Bible says that he will come like a thief into, in the night to some people, where it be an unwanted guest coming into the house. But with us, we should be anticipating that coming, where somebody will call you and uh, a lot of times you say, before you come to my house, you need to call before you come, right? <laughs> but back then, they didn't have phones, so the call was the knock on the door. Yeah. And they were calling you to come to the door. Jesus is calling you that he can come into your life and Amen. sup with you. Now, if you think about supping with somebody, when you sit down to dinner with somebody, you get to know them uh, very well, right? You notice if they smack on their food, right? <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> what kind of food they like to eat if they... Elbows on the table. You get to know a person when you sit down and start to conversate with somebody. What Jesus is saying, I want to come in so that I can get to know you and so that you can get to know me also, right? But I cannot do that unless you open the door. Amen. 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 So if you think about that, if you want to go from uh, a different position from where you are right now, and uh, I think about the story of Zacchaeus. Uh, let's turn over to uh, Luke chapter 19. And Zacchaeus was, was a, a man, he was short, he was a short guy. So I relate to him in that uh, uh, area because of his stature. And, but he had an occupation where he was a publican. And uh, we find out there are other publicans, Matthew or uh, other known as Levi was a publican and Jesus came to him and asked him, to follow him, right? And what a publican is was a, a tax collector. But the thing was that the Roman government had come and take control over that area where in, over the Jews. And were, they were under the submission of the Roman government. And so under, being under the submission, the Roman government wanted them to pay taxes. So what they did in order to make it seemingly easier for the people to pay taxes that they got Jews to collect the money. All right. But the Jews viewed them people as part of the enemy. You taking my money to give to the government. And basically what that was is an IRS person. All right. How many of us enjoy the IRS? If the IRS, the IRS come knocking at the door, right? they do, right? They are calling on the phone. But he was not like because of that also, uh, in order for him to make money, he would have to charge a little bit more service fee on top of that. So the Bible says here that he was uh, rich. So he became rich off of these people's taxes, right? And then charging them that extra money, he became rich. And so he was considered as a sinner to all the Jews, basically. When you see publican in the Bible, it always puts him the publican and the sinner. Every time you see this, the publicans and the sinners, even they have the publican and the hearted, so they put them together as being, uh, that's how they view them as sinners, as uh, traitors, or, or those who are against the, the people, right? And so uh, this was uh, Zacchaeus' uh, position, but he heard that Jesus was coming. Right. Right? And like I said, when you know somebody's coming that you want to come, you are you gonna welcome them in, right? Amen. And you're gonna want them to come in to and sup with you. And Zacchaeus, uh, being short in stature, and the crowd of people was there, and he wanted to get to Jesus, but because he was so short, and that it was such a big crowd, the Bible says, uh, because of the press, or that press means the crowd, because of the crowd, the crowd, he was unable to see Jesus. But not only did he want to see Jesus, the Bible here says that he wanted to see him and to know him. Amen. See, there's a lot of spectators in the crowd All right. that just wanted to see Jesus and say, I saw Jesus. See what I'm saying? They just wanted to say, I saw Jesus. Oh, I heard of Jesus. But Zacchaeus didn't just want to see him. He wanted to get to know Jesus. Right. And, you know, I think about it had to be a crowd. Everywhere Jesus went, there was a crowd. Amen. But he always seemed to pick out one certain person out of that big old crowd, right? This morning he was talking about uh, the woman with the issue of blood. And that was in the crowd, and he said that somebody touched me. Amen. All these people 
right? His disciples said, look at all these people around you. Somebody touched you, of course. But he knew that uh, it was the faith that the woman has. And the faith, I believe, that Zacchaeus has to that he didn't just want to see Jesus, but he wanted to get to know him. So this faith pushed him to the point where um, he wanted to see Jesus. And because he was so short, he ran to a sycamore tree. Yep. He ran in front of the crowd. It's like, all this crowd, I can't get to Jesus. So he ran ahead and climbed the sycamore tree. And, when he, when he, and I, I was like, what does a sycamore tree look like? I'm not a good tree climber, but most of the time they come up as a, a full uh, middle part, but then they branch out like this. And then there's that little part in the middle where most of the time people will, kids play at and things of that nature. But most of the time the tree grows like that. So there's an area where people climb up and they can see. And he had climbed up to that area and sat down and he was waiting for Jesus to come. And when Jesus got there, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus. All right. And he saw him and he said, to come down. He said, today salvation has come to your house. I will sup with you. And you know when he said that, uh, Salvation, even his name, Jesus Christ, means salvation in itself. So when he said salvation is coming to suffer, you say, I'm coming to suffer. Mm -hmm. And to know when you have, when you allow Jesus to come into your life, when you open la puerta to Jesus and allow him to come into your life, then he can suck with you and he's going to make some changes in your life. And, and, yeah. and look, in this story, it's a beautiful story because uh, we see those, you know, we teach the five steps of salvation, right? Right? Yeah. right. Well, let's look at this, right? It says that it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, it is lawful. Hold on. I'm in the wrong one. I'm in Matthew. Sorry. Luke. No, oh, you got there already. I wasn't. And Jesus. Yo, I read all that. All right. Here we go. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans. And he was rich, right? And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. All right. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree yes. to see him. So first we see here it says that Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming and he sought to see him. All right? So when you hear about somebody coming, and we know that you're supposed to hear that. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And when you hear that that faith is the belief, right? So those are the hear and believe, right? And he believed it. And so then uh, we see, if we read along, we see that when he got to Jesus, he said, um, when Jesus told him to come down out of the tree, and made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they, and this is verse 7, it says that when um, when they saw, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with the man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I have given to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. This is him repenting. See? He said that I have done these things, but now I have changed my mind, Amen. and I know I have to change my way, so the, the money I was stealing to get rich, I done gave back to the people that I was stealing from. See, he said that I have um, uh, changed my ways when he came to Christ, so we hear that he heard that Jesus was coming. He believed that Jesus would have to have some power, because he said, Lord, right, when he said to him, and that was a confession. Right? He confessed him to be the Lord, right? And then when, when he accepted him to come in, and that's when um, the Bible says that he came and he supped with them. And that's when you begin to build that relationship with God. And that's that connection that we talk about. When we are baptized in the water of river baptism, we are connected to the blood. And then we build that relationship. He says you are a new creature. You walk in the newness of who? Life. The newness of life, right? But newness of 
Christ. In Christ, right? That new life is in Christ Jesus. So okay. then that relationship now puts you into Christ and that fellowship and that uh, uh, togetherness and that something will put you into Christ. And see, um, like I said, he ran for and you know what? Sometimes this story, it let me understand that uh, he understood who Jesus was and he knew that he needed Jesus in his life. And that's why he ran ahead of the crowd. He Sometimes, you know, we have to get of ahead of it all, you know, we have to get above it all, even to the step where we have to sometimes uh, our trials and tribulations in life won't allow us to see Jesus. Amen. Right? They said that the crowd was pressed where he couldn't see Jesus, and sometimes our life troubles and tribulations in our lives and people we know cause us to not to be able to see Jesus, right? Amen. And we have to be able to get above it all, right? We have to climb above all that mess. And the messy people, right? So that we can be able to see Jesus. Because uh, if we allow those things to keep us from seeing Jesus, we won't be able to understand Him. We won't be able to know Him. And when we're not knowing Him, we won't know what He wants us to do. He won't, we won't know what He wants for us to do and how we should be if we don't know Him, right? And so we can't allow nothing to hinder our relationship. So uh, the door sometimes is used as a protection. That's why we have those peepholes, right? And people, you know, when you're behind that door, you feel secure. But, uh, you know, one time, my, my kids, I was asleep. I was working nights and I was asleep. And my kids had opened the door to somebody, you know? And it was just a, a, a I guess like a, a salesman or whatever he was. And, but when I woke up and I always see my, my door, my security was gone. And then I had an unwanted guest there, right? But when you open to Jesus, right? And Amen. you know that it's somebody who's coming with something that you want. You, you ever seen that publisher's clearinghouse? <laughs> if they knock on your door and you look through that peephole, you ain't gonna say, oh, you guys hide, get there. Don't open the door, right? You gonna open that door, come on in, right? Because they got something for you. And it's the same way when Jesus is knocking at your door. Amen. He has something for you. And a lot of us have let him in. And sometimes, though, look at when somebody comes visit you, they don't stay forever, right? They leave eventually. So the thing is that when Jesus leaves out your house, the thing is, what are you going to do? Stay in your house or are you going to follow Jesus? Remember when he called Matthew from the table? And when he called all his apostles, he says, follow me. And the Bible says they laid down everything yeah. and followed him. you you got to lay down your security that you have, that you think is your security that you have in life. You know, right. we, we, we um, are secure with our jobs, right? And I was like, that's the only thing I got left. But that ain't the only thing I got. That's the least right. of what I have left. I know that I have something greater in store for me and also in me right now. Because I have the gift of the Holy Spirit in me, right? And I have Amen. that hope and, and I have that joy and that peace and that love that can't be explained by none of these things in this world, right? We know people... Uh, have possessions and things like that, they still are not happy. And it's a vice versa for people who don't have nothing. They still are happy because they have a joy that cannot be explained by this worldly delight. So when we open the door to Jesus and allow him to come in, and then we get to go out of our situation, see? You open the door and you don't stay in. When you open the door of your house and you about to leave, you don't just open the door and just stand there. Right? You step out of the door, right? And we have to be able to step out of the door on faith. Amen. Right? And know that when we step out of the door, Christ is going to show us something. And after he's going to sup with us, now he's going to, the Bible says that we add to our faith knowledge and virtue. And he's going to show us how to be virtuous. How to, Amen. the knowledge that we need so that we can know how to get through these situations that we go through. So we don't have to be afraid behind the door anymore, right? And we don't have to worry about who's coming to the door because we have security now through Christ Jesus, right? Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing. And Zacchaeus, he, he knew, he was short and he knew that he had to get above all that mess. And he said, the only way that I can do this, obviously, is to climb the tree. But I always wonder what made him stick out further. I know he was in the tree. And Jesus probably seen him in. And, but it was his desire to know Jesus, right? right? Everybody was there. People was there. Everybody wanted to see him. They seen him. They was there to see Jesus. But it was something more that 
that Zacchaeus had where he climbed up that tree and uh, he knew that he needed Jesus. Right. He knew that he was considered as one of the sinners. Right? And the Bible says that Jesus, or Jesus himself said that I've come not for the those who are already saved, but I've come for those that are sinners. Right? And I thought about that and I was like, well, who was not in need of salvation? That he was but it was nobody there who did not need salvation. But he was talking about those who were looking for salvation. All right. Those who were trying to be saved, who wanted to be saved. A lot of those people thought they were saved already. The Pharisees thought they were saved already, right? And the Sadducees, that's why he always called them hypocrites. Because they thought they were already righteous. They didn't think they needed Jesus, right? But he came and showed them that, hey, you need me because you all messed up. Right? You done messed up the law already. And you have messed up the way uh, the, that you should be living and treating one another. And that's why he had to knock down that wall of division. Because there was racism amongst them in there. So there was no love, right? So he had to come and change all that. But those Pharisees was not letting him in. Right? right? They wouldn't let him in. And he says, I'm, I'm, it's like, who is this man who has this teaching? And he said, these words that I'm speaking are not my own. He said, these are the words of the one who sent me. Yeah. And he said, if you knew the one who sent me, then you would know me and you would know my word. But Amen. Jesus said that I am the gate and that no man, all right, let's look at that. We're talking about the sheep and the gate. No. Uh, in, uh, in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 9, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. Mm -hmm. The same is a thief and a robber. All right. So many people are trying to get to God some other way. Amen. They're trying to climb the fence on the side, right? They're, not, they're trying to go all around about the way, but they're not trying to enter through the door, right? And there are, there's a, I've been uh, studying this Gnostic belief. And they believe that this mysticism and all these different ways will lead you to this one. That's what Oprah always talks about. And these Scientologists and them who think that this, uh, there's all these different paths that lead to the one God. But Jesus says that I am Amen. the way. And he right. said that no man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. So he is the gate. And the order, so people say I'm on the way, but you can't get on the way unless you go through the Gate. That's why he says straight is the gate. So once you come through the straight gate, then you are on the narrow way. But until you come through Jesus, who is the gate, you cannot enter in. But he says if you try to go another way, you are a thief and a robber. He says, but he that entereth by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opened the door, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and uh, leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And so that's why I'm saying that when Jesus is at the door, we should know who's at the door. Amen. We shouldn't have to say, who is it? Right? <laughs> who, who is it? <laughs> I mean, people used to, there's so many things that people used to do when somebody comes to the door. That's why I guess phones were invented. So that we can stop tricking each other and hiding. But that that door, if the door is open, that means that Jesus can come in and out and sup with you. But if you're closing the door, then you allowing things to get in your way where you don't allow him to come into your life, then there's going to be some problems in your life. You're going to wonder, why is my house so messed up? Because you have not allowed Jesus to come in. And sup with you. And I, I man, oh man. Uh, I think about this and and I always know that uh he's always knocking. Alright. He doesn't stop knocking. You know, he's always there trying to sup with us and stay with us. And that's why I say most of us have already answered that first knocking, that first calling. But now we are uh, building that relationship with him where he comes over, right? Frequently. <coughs> And visits with us. And we suffer with him frequently. Where we open the book and we get into his love letter frequently. Right? Yeah. Where it's not only on Sunday. Right? Some some people, they don't open their Bible until Sunday. They don't, they, the door is closed basically. They don't allow him to come in 
and flow. But like I said, that gate is a protection to keep you from things from coming in and out. But if you don't have that door there no more, and you open that door, you allow him to come in. And he can do and work in you. If you but if you keep closing him off, you can't do no more. Like, oh, I'm standing at the door. I try to go to somebody's house today. I was standing on the porch just to knock him. Nobody came. And if nobody comes to the door, what does that usually mean? Nobody. Ain't nobody there, right? Or <laughs> they don't want to be bothered, right? So, but Jesus is knocking still. And he knows sometimes you don't want to be bothered. Sometimes we are like that. We don't want to be bothered with Jesus. I need to handle my business. I need to do what I need to do. But we need to let him become a resident in our life. Amen? Amen. That's why the Bible says that we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that indwelling. But if we're like, all right, you got to go. You done overstayed your welcome. Come back later or something like that. Then you don't, you're losing that relationship with that person. Right? Right? But if he is freely able to enter in and, and live with you and, and dwell with you, then he's able to work with you. And um, knowing that Zacchaeus was a short man, we have to realize that we all have come short. Yeah. Amen. See, we have that mind state that I'm short. I need some help to reach that next level. I need somebody to come and help me. The Bible says we all are short in stature right. when it comes to God, right? right? And the only way that we can be built up is through Jesus Christ, right? Amen. He says if you lift my name up, then he said in due time, yes. your time, that he will lift you up, right? Amen. So we have to be able to uh, understand that uh, we need Jesus in our life. Amen. And, and, and that we should be Wanting him to come into our lives and dwell with us. All right. And and uh, that we should be running. Brother uh, Smith read that scripture for the meditation that whosoever seeks him, he says that are diligently seeking him. Well, okay. That's why I said a lot of people was there in that crowd, but Zacchaeus was diligently Amen. seeking right. him to the point where he climbed up a tree. That's probably out of his character. A rich man climbing a tree. Huh? Right? He, should, he could pay somebody to get on their back. But he went outside of character and climbed up a tree. And if you look at those trees, they are they have a lot of branches and uh when 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 uh you know when they have all the leaves, you can't really see inside the tree, it's just a bunch of leaves everywhere. But when all the leaves are off, it's just a bunch of sticks and branches. And so he had to get up there, he probably had to, got poked and it, it, I don't believe it was a comfortable spot to be in. But he took himself out of an uncomfortable position so that he can get close to Christ. And sometimes we have to take ourselves out of our comfy position, right? We have to step out, like I said, on faith and try the Lord. He says, try me. Yes, sir. Try me. But a lot of we don't want to try him because we don't want to be tried ourselves. <laughs> right? But we need to let him try us so he can fix us. So he can work us and, and use us and mold us. That's why he says we are a workmanship. And he comes in and he works us. And and and, um, and like I said, those knocks that we hear, we, we must be willing to hear that knock and answer that call. And then finally that once we uh, understand that the door is open, that he wants to come in. We will understand that we need him. And then we will uh, try to overstand our problems. Not allow them to, you know, control us or to uh, submerge us into a point where we no longer trust in God. You know, a lot of people, they go through their troubles and they, the first person they leave is Jesus. Right? They, oh, I need to close the door on you for now put you in the closet somewhere or something like that while I work. But Jesus is the one who's going to help you. Yes. Right? He said he supplied Amen. all of our needs. And, and if we trust in him, he is able. But we first have to let him in and diligently seek him like Zacchaeus did. We need to be able to uh, go beyond our comfort zone to try to get closer to Jesus. Amen. Right? We need to study more. Comfortably, we come home after work, we kick up our feet, turn our favorite TV show. That's our comfort zone. But sometimes we need to open that book and skip that scandal this week, right? We need to t some of this stuff and study our Bible so that we can 
get an understanding, right? And get out, get out of this comfort zone and let him come in. And, and what Jesus is going to do when he comes into your house, he's going to clean it up. Yeah. Right? He's going to clean it up. And a lot of times people don't want him to come in because our house is dirty. When, right? When your house is dirty, do you want people to come over? No. 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 <laughs> like, oh, you don't let him go get him out there. You don't let him in the house all dirty. But that's how we are. We don't want him to come in, but we need that cleaning service. Yeah. Amen. You know, we need him to come in and clean up our house. And we cannot get clean unless he comes in <laughs> to our house. And that is something we have to stress to one another and to those who are lost. That you can't get right unless Jesus is in your life. Amen. Right? Because he is the one, he's the fixer. Yeah, right. He's the master builder. He's the and he is the shepherd. And you know the shepherd keeps the sheep clean. Right? He keeps he takes all the all the impurities off of the sheep. And prepare them that they can be used for uh, the right reason. And it's important that we uh, first repent, like our kids. Change our mind. Know that we want a change in our life. Because if you don't want to change, you're not going to let him in in the first place. Amen. So we have to have a contrite heart. Know that we are in need for him to come in. And then accept him in by hearing his word as the kids heard that he was coming. Believe that he is. <clears throat> repent of our sins and change our ways. Confess him to be the Son of God. How many believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Amen. All right, that's the people of that. And to confess him, and that's why he said, Lord, he knew. Even Paul, Paul was persecuting the church, and when, when uh, Jesus came to him, he said, Lord. Right? And he knew that I ain't nobody. This, this person right here is more powerful than I am. And I need his power to help me. And then you can submit to him by being buried in the water of the grave of baptism. And then you, that's when you open the door to him. The beginning of allowing him to come in by submitting to him first. He comes to the door and he's knocking, calling you. And you opening the door is your calling him. Right? You have to let him come in. He's not just going to come in and treat you like a robot. He wants those that are true worshipers. And that true worshiping is the desire to worship. Not only the right way in the spirit, and you know, you want that desire to worship him. And there's so many people who don't want to worship God and who don't want Christ in their life. But we have allowed him into our lives. We must keep him in, put him on the lease, make him a permanent resident in our lives, right? And don't kick him out when <laughs> uh, it's convenient for you, right? And uh, then for those who are lost, we let them know that Jesus is knocking. You sing that song, somebody is knocking at your door, right? Yeah. And that person is Jesus. He is trying to come into your life so that you can be made whole. That he can change your life and clean up you from the inside. And then when you clean on the inside, the outside of the house is going to be beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to reflect on the outside. So for all those who are here, who are first word, I pray that it was uh, edifying and encouraging to you. Yeah. If there are any who are, you don't see, pray that we all stand as we sing the song of invitation that you receive this word. Amen.